What's up, everybody? Low-hanging fruit. I'm Charlie Marlowe. That is the Brendan Schaefer. Wow! Look at him down there at Cardinal Spring Training. Brendan, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Charlie. I'm so happy to be with you again and uh, that the podcast hasn't been canceled, discontinued, or anything of the like. We're, we're rolling forward. Yes, and, and by the way, we only skipped one week. Eventually, we're going to do two in one week to make up for it. So anybody complaining about that, and we will get to a more consistent schedule. Hey, Brendan's down in Florida. We'll figure it out once the season starts. But hey, let's get right to it, first of all. You said, hey, we, we got to wait 30, 40 minutes to tape this podcast because there is breaking news <laughs> on the backfields of oh, Jupiter, baby. Florida. I don't even know what it was, but you said something's going on in the backfields. What was happening? Well, it was one of those little team buildery kind of activities that sometimes they do. It seems like they do one of them per spring, and it's always something different. And it's something, I mean, you on the radio, Charlie, would have a field day, you know, cracking jokes about it, I'm sure. But I noticed it coming out when the, the players were coming out of the clubhouse this morning. Matt Carpenter was in like a red uh, visor instead of a baseball cap, and he had a golf polo tucked into his baseball pants. And the players were all coming out talking about wind conditions. And then Ollie Marmol comes out to do his daily little scrum with the media that are down here. And he said, let's keep it quick. I've got some golf to watch. So we all went back there and it was pretty quick. He got on the golf cart and zoomed away and we go back there. And it's basically, I think they were doing like a team, you know, they drafted teams and they were doing like a closest to the pin type of team-based competition. Uh, I think Matt Carpenter's team did win. He was very into it. Um, but yeah, they, they did some golf on the backfields, you know, those, those kind of things to break up the monotony of spring. It was one of those deals today. And I said, Charlie, I can't possibly miss this and consider myself a, a Cardinal reporter. So I had to make sure I had boots on the ground. Okay. So before we get to this, this year's team, several years ago during the Matheny era, when I was down there for a spring training, they did one of those things. I forgot what it's called. Remember, it was like a scavenger hunt. It was real popular. You'd go somewhere. I did one with my family once. What like was it a called? Geo, like a geo guesser kind of thing, maybe? Or No, uh... like you would. It's not called a scavenger hunt. You would go to a place and you'd have to like solve something in a room. What oh, was escape, that called? Escape room? Yes. Okay. We did that. I did that with my wife's side of the family. This was probably whatever. I don't know. Eight years ago. They and still I remember have one. But... Okay. When this was popular, I remember there was a day where everybody was leaving Cardinals camp early and they're like, hey, we're going to do a team building escape room. And I'm thinking that's literally the last these baseball players. That's the last thing they would want to do. Let's be real. Right. Come on. Escape. You room. know, Mike Matheny had ideas. You know, he, he did his best. He thought it would be he thought it would be a nice thing for team building. Right. Stick them in a room together and see if they can figure out how to leave. Uh, you know, I don't know. I wasn't there for that activity, so I don't know if it hit in the way that it was intended, but, um, I think the golfers had fun today. So, okay. All I'm saying is when I did this, I was bored immediately and I was just thinking, look, we all like each other. Why don't we just go to a bar and hang out and <laughs> drink, <we> drink? <laughs> maybe watch, maybe watch a game. Like we don't have to do the escape room, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just a different person. Okay. Moving on to baseball. How about we start here? Brandon Crawford, so I haven't talked to you since that news. You've right. spoken with him. You posted the the video, so check out B-Shafe's YouTube. I saw that got a lot of views, buddy. And also, get some views, yeah. Yeah, John Moselock talking about Brandon Crawford. So give me your take on Brandon Crawford and what's he like and what are you hearing and seeing? Well, I think Brandon Crawford fits the role the Cardinals wanted for him. That may not be one that excites the fan base, but I can think all the way back to, like, November, December, when you see or read comments from the team about what they wanted to be this year, a lot of times they were saying, yeah, Tommy Edmond, we want him to be our center fielder. We, we think he displayed good range, good instincts, good athleticism out there. When we kind of threw him out there in the middle of the year, he solidified that position and kind of calmed things down from the revolving door that it had been with Tyler O'Neill at the beginning of the year. And then Dylan Carlson would get some run. And I think he would play well. But offensively, was he enough to put in the everyday lineup? They just kind of kept rolling through guys. Lars Newpar would play some center field. Tommy went into center field. He did a nice job of it. And they thought, hey, how good could that be for our pitching staff to have a more consistent defense behind them 
to be able to, to gobble up some of those fly balls and to minimize uh, the, the run score, run prevention in whatever way you can come up with it. And I do think the Brandon Crawford signing is the move the Cardinals needed or something like it to be able to commit fully to, hey, Tommy Edmond will be a center fielder. He's not going to go back and forth this year, barring injuries that that take them away from that game plan. Without it, they wouldn't have really had that because when you look at backup shortstop, aside from Edmond, and of course, Mason Wynn's going to be the starter, you just didn't have a lot of experience there on the roster. Jose Fermin a little bit in, in, in the minor leagues, but not a great hitter. Brendan Donovan could perhaps do it at times, but he's also coming off of a major, I believe UCL surgery is actually what it was. So he's kind of recovering as well with his throwing arm and trying to get back to full strength. I think the Brandon Crawford thing is not only right now, Tommy Edmonds not healthy in terms of his recovery from the wrist surgery to know that he's going to be on the opening day roster, but even in June, July, August, once we know that Edmund is, is back and ready to go, he won't have to worry about swapping positions he can be the center fielder. So I think that's the the impetus behind the decision. And as for Crawford, I think he's at a point in his career where after a, being the everyday guy for 13 years in the, in the Giants organization, he kind of knows where he's at at age 37 and is okay with taking a role, a la Matt Carpenter on the, you know, the, the DH first baseman department, of he's going to gonna be the backup to Mason Wynn at shortstop and impart some veteran wisdom if he can. But this was positionally, they needed a shortstop and the market began to move this week with guys like Tim Anderson, Ahmed Rosario, and Nick Ahmed all signing deals. The Cardinals had to kind of act quick once that market began to move, and they landed on Brandon Crawford, who uh, said his kids wanted him to keep playing, so that's what he's going to do, and goes from getting to be in the, the Arizona spring training where he lives and has been his whole career. He said there's only a couple of teams that he would go to Florida for for spring training. Maybe it didn't seem super thrilled to to have to be uprooted in that way, but He's getting a couple million bucks from the Cardinals, and so I, I think he's going to fit the role that they're looking to to have filled. I was thinking about that, actually. When you play with one team your whole career, even though you're used to Arizona and playing in San Francisco, it's probably kind of cool, though, for a guy, once you get there, to see the Grapefruit League and see all these different complexes for these other teams. Uh, you know, I'm trying to find the silver lining. And also, here's the deal. Here's the real breaking news, Brendan. Let's be real. The Cardinals needed some more veteran mid to upper thirties guys, because they're they, a young team. If you think about it, they don't have very many. When you look at Gibson, Lynn, Michaelis, Carpenter, Arenado, Goldie, you needed a couple more. I think you need a couple more 37 year olds. Is that fair? I think there might be some truth to that rumor. You know, um, it makes sense. No, Mozilak even said, like, this wasn't the let's get another veteran leader. This was like, I we know. need a guy who can play shortstop. So I, as much as, like, it, in, it is kind of an easy sort of punching bag, the number of the old guys, older players, as you would say, that the Cardinals have uh, accrued over the offseason. But other than, like, Goldie and Arenado, most of them are one-year deals that, and even in the case of those guys, you know, Goldie's expiring after this contract, um, Arenado a couple more years. But it's not like it's a bunch of core players. I think it's guys that are on one-year deals, and if it goes well, great. Otherwise, maybe there's a little bit of veteran wisdom they can impart. And then you can look to next year and restock those roles with younger players and still have a very, like, you don't worry about the age of your core these guys are just kind of complimentary pieces. And I know that it's, like I said, easy to kind of joke about, but I, it could be fine, right? Like what's one more 37 year old on the bench. That's on a one-year contract, right? Yeah. Are you, are you basically scolding me for making that joke? Am I not allowed no. to make that joke? Because I think it's a good no, joke, but it is, good. it is easy. You know what it is? It's, it's low hanging fruit. That's, that's why what we it do is. the podcast. Yes. That's why we do the podcast. Okay. You know, I had to get my stupid joke in, uh, but you said something. I, I thought I heard you right. What did you say about Tommy Edmond when he might be back? Did you say July? No, I my point with that was you could look at the Crawford signing and think, oh, the Cardinals are doing this because Edmond's not ready health wise, and they needed like a backup plan at shortstop. My point is more, let's just fast forward it to the middle of the summer when we long expect Edmond to have been back, whether it's. April gotcha. 1st or April 21st or May 1st, whatever it ends up being. The the Crawford move, I think, is for the long run of, hey, Mason wins our guy. And Mason said, yeah, they told me that they were bringing this guy in and it kind of lit a fire under me. But I also understand that 
you know, it, this is just part of the part of the game, part of the business. He, they're going to have him be the everyday shortstop, but he doesn't want to feel like he's got the job. He wants to feel like he has to go earn it. And adding a guy who's played the position for 13 years, I think will help kind of push him a little bit even more as if he needed that motivation. But no, I think whenever Edmonds ready, it's more about they didn't do this because Edmonds not ready. Now they did it because when he is ready, they don't want him to have to be an infielder. And I've been saying all off season, that's what they should do. I just didn't know that maybe Brandon Crawford specifically would be the means to an end to make that happen. But they told Edmund last year who's going to be the shortstop. And then Paul DeYoung hits one homer and they're like, uh, Edmund, you're actually every other position because Paulie needs to play shortstop. It's like, can they maybe cater to Edmund this year? Not that he's asked for it. I think he's the, the personality that just says, yeah, whatever you need. But I also think that it was kind of high time that they give him a chance to run with one spot and be great at it, which they're going to they're planning to do this year with center field. Do you think he can be great at it? And I asked that I love his range. Let's be real. You don't you don't love the arm from center. I still think I still like Tommy Edmond long term as a gold glove second baseman. I, I think the reason he's playing center, it's not necessarily that he's great, although he's a pretty dang good center fielder. To me, it's more about who's around him and the fact that you don't have Harrison Bader anymore and somebody like Dylan Carlson hasn't established himself yet. So also, though, what do you think from from what you're hearing? When do you think and, and we're not going to you know, we're not going to hold you to this, but when do you think Tommy Edmond may be ready if you had to pinpoint a date? I, I told the cat this morning on Hot Take Central that I feel like it's a toss up to me that he'll be on the opening day roster. Like I'd put it 50 50, but what makes it difficult to kind of parse out a timeline is that once he ramps up the specific type of activity that he needs to do, I think it can happen within three to five days that he'll go from, yeah, we have literally no idea to he's ready to play because defensively he's been able to track balls. He's been throwing as well on the backfields in some of the drills that I've seen going back like to a week, 10 days ago, not full strength throwing, but enough to where it's like, all right, he's ramping toward that. It's hitting that he's behind on. And specifically it was just one side of the plate that he was more behind than the other. I think right-handed swinging, he was needing to still catch up a little bit to where it sounded like he was maybe even doing some kind of coach pitch and just like batting practice stuff, not lives where he's facing pitchers trying to get him out, but just regular BP. But from the right side, it was more like off a tee, um, front toss, just like more drills to ramp his way back up to full strength swinging. So let's say once he's able to do that and he's even from the right side and left side in terms of activity, swinging a bat, then he progresses to live BP, a pitcher on the backfield trying to get him out and he's trying to swing and get a hit. And it's competitive as it can be without being in a game. And then you go from that to you're playing in Grapefruit League games getting a, a, a few at bats from both sides of the plate. That's once that step to live BP happens, I feel like he could be all the way done within five days from that, maybe even four days from that. So there's time, but less and less time as we go along, if he doesn't continue to make that progress and down here, it's been every couple of days, a report will be like, Hey, so Tommy is anything going on? And there's been kind of like, eh, he's working his way up. So we, it's really hard to say, you're going to get to a point in mid-March where it's like, if that's not the week that he really starts to kick it into gear, is there time for it to happen? And at that point, probably maybe not, but could it simply be two, three weeks behind that and he's ready in mid to late April? That would probably be my best guess until we hear, oh, there's been a setback, which we haven't heard there. You know, And again, would they tell us if there was one? Maybe not, unless it was like absolutely necessary to do so. But it sounds like they kind of knew from talking to trainers that it would be there'd be days where he felt great. And then he's a little sore the next day. And then it, it's kind of a, an up and down curve is the way that Ollie described it. So I think there's still certainly time. But until we see that actual tangible ramp up, I can't say, yeah, he's going to be ready on March 28th or whatever it is that they're in Los Angeles. OK, you know how fun, fun narratives get started, especially on you want me to call it Twitter still, not X, correct? I've never called it X because I just think that's stupid. And so okay. I call it Twitter. You can do whatever you'd like, but I, it, it's long. It's a mouthful to say X, formerly Twitter. Just, just call it Twitter. That's kind of my take. You can do what you want. Okay. I'll just call it Twitter slash X. So the, okay. the fun little, and let's be real, it's, it's stupid. The stupid narrative going around, and now I'm, uh, I'm taking it hook, line, and sinker, is the Cardinals haven't hit a home run yet in the first it's week. Look, we all know. Roger Dean Stadium, it's not the easiest ballpark to hit in. 
I don't think this is anything whatsoever. Nothing. Has it huh? crept in? Has it crept in now? Like, are people asking the Cardinals players, is there going to be a scoreboard? Like, are they gonna are they gonna basically celebrate when they hit their first Grapefruit League homer? It's like that thing at the the factory that says, however many days since there's been an accident. They're counting up however many days since they've hit a homer. Uh, no, I don't think anybody, I've not asked any players about it because I think you'd get a, a, a quizzical look. Uh, there might be a point. Well, you're a bad reporter. Well, I probably am. And I own that, right? I own that. But I, you know, the first game that they didn't get any runs on Wednesday was the game in Port St. Lucie, the windiest ballpark in America for whatever that's worth. Dylan Carlson had a play where he like allowed a double because he just like missed the ball. And I'm like, that's pretty windy out there. I'm not going to go crazy about that. But they didn't score any runs. And then yesterday they scored like one run in the ninth inning when all the starters were out of it. So like, it's something to note. My my perspective on this is they have to be like a top five or seven offense this year to win with the way that they're built. Because I think we would agree their rotation, if you don't think it stinks, and a lot of Cardinals fans, I see the YouTube comments, oh, it stinks. I don't know. We'll see. But like, even I'm not going to go so optimistic to say they could be a top 10 rotation. They're going to be like 12th through 18th or so in terms of their rotation. If I had to guess like my median expectation. So what does that mean? You've got to be better in one area or another. I think the bullpen can be top 10, top 12, but it also might not be the, the offense almost has to be like a, an elite unit. And you look on paper and I could absolutely see it coming together, but if they go through the spring and they're not, doing that you kind of go okay i mean is it going to come together but remember they were grapefruit league champs last year and they they had a 91 loss season so it could go any direction i would look at individuals right i would look at mason win like i think it's important that he has a good spring because they're going to rely upon him i think it's important that jordan walker starts to ramp it up a bit in spring and he hasn't looked great in the grapefruit league games but it's very early so i'm not freaking out about it but it would be nice to have him hit one today so that we don't have to keep talking about it but as of this recording before the game on Friday afternoon, yeah, no dingers. Okay, here's a good uh, comment from Twitter. It's from Tupac was a Cards fan. He what says the overreaction by the fans, Tupac is still alive, by the way. What the overreaction he? by the fans over the first week of spring is pathetic, in my opinion. Does everyone forget they had the best record in spring 2023? Brendan just said that. We didn't read that much into it then. Why should we now? It shows people love having something to be outraged about. And I agree with that 100%. Here's one more. Great value speaker says the small sample from some of the young starters who will likely start the season at Memphis, as well as the bullpen arms acquired in the off season has looked pretty fair. Okay. You said something that I think is uh, very interesting and it's about what the offense has to do. I think if we're being fair, you know, we're all hoping Sonny Gray is going to have an ERA in the in the threes. Let's let's hope. And I know ERA is not the only thing we should focus on, but it's an easy stat to throw out there. I would think almost everybody else in the starting rotation will probably be in the fours or dang close to it, if I'm just being fair about it. So I do think what you said about having, you know, I don't know if it's top five offense, top top seven. You know, you can look at, a lot of people look at OPS. You know, at the end of the day, it's about scoring runs. But I think you can look at, look, the Cardinals are going to have to win a lot of games, probably 6-5, 5-4, 4-3. Four, Quality starts are good, but that means a lot of times Lance Lynn's leaving probably in the sixth, allowing three runs. Let's say the bullpen gives up one in in three innings. That means you got to win 5-4. Yeah, and I think that's how they've built it. I don't know if they would be as like open if you asked it that way and said, Hey, it's just kind of the way this team is built. I don't know if they'd tell you that, but we can look at it and go, it kind of feels that way. If we're going to say that the, the guys who can get you deeper into games, they might give up three or four runs in the first two innings, but you look up four innings later and, and Kyle Gibson's gotten you through five and two thirds. Like you're still alive in that, in that contest, but now the bullpen has to be asked to basically, Hey, we did the part of not overworking you because you only have to cover these last three innings but we also need you to not give up any runs because the offense is down now four to three. They've, they've gotten a few across, but we need to give them that, that latitude to be able to make the comeback. Like they're going to be, that's going to be, I think a, a challenge of this Cardinals team is like, can the offense grind it nine innings to be able to turn some of those four, three deficits into a five, four win. I completely think that's the way the Cardinals are built this year. Now it also could play out that sometimes Lance Lynn goes six innings and gives up one and, and looks good, but there are going to be other games where he goes six and gives up five. 
And what what can you expect from the offense on those days? They're going to have to be able to claw back in in some of these games, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th. And last year, sort of the narrative was, well, if they got down early, it was often one of those games where you could just kind of feel it in the air that they were going to kind of lull to sleep and not be able to make that comeback effort. May Is the factor of knowing that you've got guys like Lyndon Gibson that are going to get through six anyway, even if they give up some early ones, can that be enough to keep the offense in games is probably a fair question that we'll have to see them answer. Okay. I'm just reading some of these other Twitter questions and comments, and they can give us some content as well. But also, I'd like to throw it out there. And then, you know, people like to hear their question being asked, Brendan. You know that. They do. And by the way, if you have any extra ones, you can do a podcast solo that you can just kind of take the rest of the questions and be able to come up with some more content for your channel. Who would ever do such a thing (laughs) like that? I'll tell you who wouldn't. John Filippello. What is it? John Filippello. He says, good enough position players to win a World Series. They are, however, one frontline pitcher for making a serious run. I agree with that, and I think most people agree with that. You mentioned Jordan Walker. This is from Seth Teal. He's still very young, and it's only a few at-bats, but Walker's strikeout rate right now is insane. Jordan Walker, and I'm just throwing, again, I don't even think this is a big deal, but it's talkable. Jordan Walker, one for 10 in four games with five punch-outs. What are you seeing? Do you feel like you need to go in there and maybe work on his swing with him? I don't think I have the uh, the credentials to do that, but I think he'll come around because we saw him as like a, what, 20, 21-year-old hold his own. Even if his numbers weren't like incredible, didn't win rookie of the year, didn't, I don't think he finished in the top three or anything like that either. But like he was very much holding his own against major league pitching at such a young age to where like it's not just going to go away and disappear. He might just be having a little bit of a, a of a rough go to begin spring training, but I think he's going to come around and be one of the Cardinals' better hitters. And it's interesting when you look at the way their lineup is going to shake out, you kind of expect him to be batting like seventh in the order. So I think he's really important to this year's team. I, I agree it hasn't looked great so far, but I also look at it and say if he comes through with what he did last year and maybe even bumps that up a little more in terms of OPS and overall production, like that's how you look at this lineup on paper and think, man, this is going to be something that has a chance to be really good. Lars Newbar is trying to to modify his swing and and gain more power. And and if he's somebody that bats in the middle of the order, how impactful can that be for the Cardinals? Like, I think they've got a very good lineup on paper. It's just about getting all those guys going at the same time. And I, Jordan Walker, you know, one for ten. Let's let's wait till he's one for forty in spring and be like, okay, this is a problem. But I imagine he'll come through here before too long. I agree with you, sir. And let's hey, let's focus on a positive here. Nolan Arenado, he's a good ball player. He'll probably make the Hall of Fame. Hey, he's four for nine right now. Couple of dubs, right? He's got a couple of ribbies. Uh, we just need that home run because, again, the fans back here in St. Louis, they're really worried that the Cardinals have not hit a home run in one week of Grapefruit League games. Okay, Brendan Schaefer. Again, I am I hate that I'm doing this, but I am. I'm like doing this whole podcast overreacting and commenting to the overreactions on Twitter. But I also find it funny because, and it's not just Twitter, by the way. It's also the comment section here on YouTube, which I love. And I do read almost all of them. But it's always funny because, like, Kyle Gibson yesterday, what, gives up two bombs. So two innings, three hits, three earned runs, struck out two, no walks. It's his it's his first time out there. But people are, oh, two home runs. So Kyle Gibson, I also think, look, you said, you said something a couple minutes ago that I think people need to focus on more. We all do. Somebody like Lars Newtbar. Lars Newtbar is on the team. You said Lars Newtbar is using spring to try to generate more power. I don't know that Kyle Gibson is doing this, but if you have a contract and you're on the team, you're trying to get ready. You're trying to build up your pitch count. You may be working on a pitch to see if you can use it in spring. I'm not trying to take anything off Kyle Gibson. I think some of these guys who are established, they also use the Grapefruit League to get ready for the real games. So Kyle Gibson, what are you seeing? I mean, look. Look, it's it's one freaking outing. Remember Miles Michaelis, his first spring was awful when he had the amazing year. So there you go. Yeah, I actually asked Kyle Gibson about that yesterday and asked, like, compared to your first couple of years in trying to crack into the big leagues, do you feel like now the results of these early spring training outings? Like, because he said, it's not about the results right now. I'm 
I might throw, uh, know that coming into this outing, I want to throw a two-strike breaking ball, but I don't know if I'm going to get into a two-strike count. So I told the catcher coming in, like in this 0-1 count, that might be where I'm saying, hey, this is what I would try to execute if it's, if it's strike three for, and the results of the game may not show that. And he even said, that's not me making excuses and saying, oh, that's what I was doing on the home runs I gave up. And so that's why. No, that's not even what he's saying. It's just like you are working on some different things and it is a much different situation than when he was first coming into the league because he knows he's on the team. He knows he's in the rotation and he knows that kind of mixing and matching and being able to focus on specific things throughout an outing that we may not as reporters ask him. Yeah. Can you list one through five, the things you were going through? Like it's, it's kind of not that deep is one way that I would say it. Whereas compared to like a Matthew Libertor on Friday is starting for the second time in Grapefruit League. We know that if there's an injury to a guy in the rotation, it's going to be him or Zach Thompson that wins that spot. So I think the results a little bit more for him do matter because he's still in that stage of his career where he's trying to prove himself, which isn't to say that if he gives up a bomb, you go, oh, Libby stinks. And like, that's going to tell the story of his future. You're just kind of gathering data points, but it's also helpful to know specifically what different guys might be working on. John King has given up a bomb and runs and doubles. And the other day, Ollie was asked about, you know, what have you seen from John King? And he said, you know, there's a specific two pitch mix that he's working on. And almost regardless of results right now, we're just looking at him to, to prioritize this specific thing that he's doing, which is that a way to take some heat off a guy for having a bad start to spring? Maybe. But he did say, as we get more into March, then we're going to start to look at it and say, okay, now the results are going to have to matter because we're picking who's going to make this bullpen. So it is nice to take some of that stuff with a grain of salt. And sometimes can we go the route of just optimistic no matter what? Like it counts if it's somebody doing something good, but it's not, it doesn't count if they're doing something bad. Like that can be a tendency of spring. But like, I, I just think in general, it's good to learn more and to know as much as we can about the baseball team going into the year. And then the real season will happen and we'll be able to evaluate things in a little bit of a different way. But for now, I still think there's value to just kind of being around and, and seeing what these guys are up to and, and trying to explain a little bit of what we're seeing. Yeah. I also think two pitch mix would be a good name for a podcast. It would be two a very pitch good name. mix, yeah. but I like low hanging fruit. A couple more. Too. Yeah. A couple more Twitter comments. Sunny gray aside for me, they just didn't do enough. That's from one dog. DeWallet Inspector. This team is a DeWallet ball special. They'll be in the mix for a bottom four playoff spot and will get ushered out within two rounds. Well, they're saying they might win a round, though. I believe <laughs> they might actually. Yeah, I believe they might actually win a playoff game this year, though. OK, that's that's quasi positive. Matt says this has been their plan since Tony left. Don't try and build a championship contender. Put a decent team together and hope to get hot at the right time. I think that's fair. Look, we've talked about that a million times. Here's here's something else I think is interesting. It's actually baseball-y. And you mentioned it earlier about the bullpen. I find this interesting. I'm not saying this is all Heim Bloom, but I think a good model. Careful. And it seems like it seems like what's that? I said, be careful. Is, the cat will have your ass. Well, that's when you, you, you have to defend your position, uh, you know, and you keep defending it. Um, so here's my thing though. It looks like the smart way to build a bullpen is to have just several options, right? Not just guys with options, but I mean, like, think about it. If you have, let's say, 10 to 12 relievers that you think are big league caliber, right? We know relievers are super volatile. Even the best ones, there's a lot of volatility. I think what the Cardinals have done with getting a lot of guys, guys with options, rule five type guys, 4A guys, you just never know if, look, probably half of them will be good and half will be bad. There'll be a lot of volatility. We see that with all relievers. But it seems like the way to really build a modern bullpen is to try to do it on the cheap. Unless, I mean, if you could get, obviously, like a Josh Hader. But to try to do it on the cheap with a bunch of options and just bank it on the fact that with the volatility of relievers, half of those guys are going to be good. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. Now, you have to be right on some of the guys that you pick up in that bucket. Like, it's a bucket of bu a bucket of humans, and you have to figure out a way for some of them to be reliable and turn into, you know, you shine them, you polish them up, and they, oh, this guy's good, this guy's reliable. Kind of where JoJo Romero was, right? They traded Edmundo Sosa to get him. 
he was a guy who was stuffed, but like hadn't really figured it out. And now he's come to a spot where he's got confidence in what he's doing. And the Cardinals are going into this year saying, yeah, he's one of our guys that we can bank on along with Helsley, along with Giovanni Gallegos. And you kind of have that core. You pick up Kittredge and Keenan Middleton where you didn't have to overpay for either of them. Really? I don't know offhand what Keenan Middleton's making, but Kittredge was, you trade Palacios who you didn't figure was going to be factoring too much beyond being like a bench bat. And those are guys with some experience in, in bullpens on contending teams. And now you're up to five guys. And then it's like Riley O'Brien and and Wilking Rodriguez is back on a minor league deal. And maybe a couple of those guys pan out to go with your Palantes and your John Kings and bam, you've got a bullpen. It's pretty much the same strategy they used last year. It's just that I think they got a couple more guys this time that at least we've seen it from before when it comes to Kittredge and Middleton. And then last year, you could look down the list of everybody they had in that bucket failed because they were either injured like Wilking or, Zuniga didn't pitch well in triple a like they got a bunch of those kind of guys last year and it just they were wrong about almost all of them in the context of the 2023 season I don't think it's wrong to basically approach it the way that they have this year you just need to be right on a few more of those guys than you were last year and I think the bullpen I don't know where you would would kind of mark it Charlie but I think it's a top half to maybe you could you could say we could see a top 10 bullpen if things do break in a better direction with with some of those guys that yeah they're volatile but they could be volatile in a good way like Riley O'Brien throwing 98 if he ends up being a guy with stuff where he's like the fifth or sixth best guy in your bullpen but he's good suddenly you you kind of have something there and that's what they're hoping to do okay just as you said this I I thought of a fun game for us here let's let's try to predict I'm not going to ask you for a win total yet okay let's ask you and and I'll say as well to predict where you think we'll, we'll break it down like this We'll go offense, we'll go starting staff, relievers, and we'll just go overall defense. We'll block it out in in fives. So you have to say either top five, top 10, top 15, top 20. And, and I haven't even given this much thought, but I'll, I'll go first. So I think the Cardinals are going to be a top 10 offense in baseball. Top five, eh, top 10, I, I think they'll be a top 10 offense. I would say their starting staff is going to be somewhere between 15 and 20. Now, could they get to 10 to 15? Sure. I'm just going to say the way they're comprised now, I'm going to say 15 to 20. I think the bullpen could be better than we expect. I'm going to put bullpen somewhere between 10 and 15. The defense, the metrics are kind of crazy there. The defense has to be cleaned up. That has to be at least, don't you think, like, top, you know, 15 to 20. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm, I'm throwing a lot of mediocre out there, but if you, if you kind of put that together, I do look at the Cardinals as a top 10 ish to 12 ish team in baseball. And I think that probably checks out. I would, I would think with what I said, what do you think? Yeah. And I'm trying to think, I think they need to be top six or so offensively, but if I were going to predict it, I'm going to say top 10, and maybe a little closer to 10 than five like that. Making that jump is what really I think could put them in a great spot. Um, again, on paper, I see it, but inevitably, you know, there might be some, some guys that don't land at their median projection to be able to be that top five offense. So I'll say top 10 offense rotation. I would also be in that bucket between 16 and 20 where I'm hesitant to say top 15, but I would say top 16 more confidently. Like I think they're going to be right on that line to be very, middle of the pack in the rotation bullpen. Uh, I think they could be a top 10, top 12 bullpen. Um, but it's probably, if I was going to say like with confidence, I'll put them at 11th through 15th, but that's one unit that if I'm wrong about in, in they're better than I thought it wouldn't shock me. Like, I think there are the pieces there. If everybody gets through healthy and, and at their best, they could be top six or eight and it wouldn't really surprise me, but I'll go, you know, top 15, but more maybe closer to, to 10 than 15 defensively is where I think we differ a little bit that I think they'll be really good. As long as Tommy Edmond is in there, I think they can be a top, certainly top 15, but maybe even push to be a top 10 defense. If guys like Arenado and Goldie bounce back, especially because Mason wins going to be good. Tommy's I like Tommy in center field. I think it could be good. Bless you. Bless you. Okay. I, I, I thought myself. I tried to on that, on that sneeze. I told you I've got the allergies going down here. I feel for you. See, that was one of those things, people watching on YouTube, 
I wasn't sure if you were just sneezing to continue your thought, but you were actually sneezing after you had finished your thought, correct? I thought I could get the whole thought out before sneezing, and I was right. But my eyes are watering. It was tough. There's there's some pollen in the air or something down here. My allergies have been killing me. And my son, too. He's got, like, the watery eyes and sneezing. So uh, I don't know what it is about Jupiter, but it's not agreeing with me the last couple of days. You're playing hurt, man. I am. You're fighting through it. I'm tough. So, hey, that's fun. We'll get back to baseball, but family time. What's the most fun thing you did? Are you taking your kids? I guess you're working these games, so you can't really take your your son to the game, right? Yeah, he has not gone to a game. Um, my wife's parents went to a game yesterday. My wife didn't really care about going, and he took a nap during it. So, you know, that worked out. We went to the beach, though, a couple times. Hey, hold on. And, hey. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Hey, the Cardinals took a nap all of 2023, so oh. it's fine. <laughs> you love to hear it. Yeah, we went to the beach a couple times. He likes to pick up the sand and throw it at you. He's like almost a year and a half. So he had a lot of fun there, and we've gone out to some a lot of meals. You know, the food's great down here, so that's been the other the other thing we've focused on. He's gone to some parks and played, but a lot of that's happening during the day when I'm working, so I'm trying to take as much advantage in the evenings as I can, but the schedule sucks down here. Not to complain. I'm in, I'm in it's like paradise. You know, Jupiter's great, but. We're working hard trying to provide KMOV good content, then do some YouTube on the side. But uh, yeah, it's been awesome because I wouldn't have been able to do this for three weeks if my family wouldn't have been able to join for like the last week because I was like I was waiting by the front door when their car was coming up so I could see my son for the first time in two weeks. We're not doing we're not gonna be able to do this again next year. We got to come up with like a different plan of just getting them down here the whole time or something like something's got to give because that was a little tough for sure. But I'm glad they're here now. There you go. All right. Uh, also, haven't spoken with you since the Cody Bellinger news. So let's let's talk a little NL Central. Do you think now now Pakoda had Cardinals eighty five, Cubs eighty wins. That's right. I saw, you're you're a gambler guy. I saw on one what? site that they had pumped up the Cubs win total after the Cody Bellinger move from like eighty three and a half to eighty four and a half. So really? it's a little different than Pakoda. What I can't yeah. remember. Maybe it was eighty two to eighty three. Don't quote me on that. But do you, do you still think the Cardinals are the are the favorite in the division? You think the Cubs are going to be right there? Do you feel like Milwaukee will surprise people and, and be in it? What do you think? I think Milwaukee will surprise the people that looked at the Burns trade with the Baltimore Orioles and said, oh, Milwaukee's toast. They're going to be last place. Like, I've seen some of that sentiment out there, and I don't really agree with that. I think that Milwaukee's, like, median expectation for me, pretty close to where Pakota has them, where they have, like, 79.7 as of today. Um, the Cubs have bumped on Pakoda to 81.8, Cardinals 84.6. I think Cubs around 83 is right. Cardinals around 84, 85 is about right. Um, so I would still lean Cardinals over Cubs, but there's really there's virtually no gap there. And it wouldn't surprise me if the Cardinals, again, if they're not a top five offense, they're like the 11th best offense. And if their rotation doesn't crack that top 15, it's more like top 18. And the bullpen is right around the middle. And, and maybe the defense isn't as good as I'm projecting it to be because Tommy's not healthy enough to start the year, which, by the way, you mentioned, like, what kind of center fielder can he be? And I never really answered it. I think he can be really good. I think the range and athleticism is the most important thing. And the arm is like, whatever, like, how many guys are they really throwing out at home plate anyway? I just don't I'm not as worried about the arm as some people. I think his range will help a staff that pitches to contact. So that's kind of where I'm I'm sort of landing on having him in center defensively. But like if instead of being optimistic about those different areas of the team, they slide a little bit lower than our expectations, they're right around an 80, 82 win team that they're going to have to find that extra gear to get above the Cubs now that they've signed Bellinger. If the Cubs are able to kind of hit on some of their guys that they're hoping can emerge. I still think the Reds are tricky too. like the Reds have the highest upside for me in the whole division because what happens if those young position players all kind of take another step and the young pitchers, they have a lot of good young pitching that have not all put it together. But what if two or three of them do this year and they've got the best rotation in the division, like they could just win 90 games. And, you know, I don't know if the Cardinals have an upside much greater than 90 unless the rotation really surprises us. That's fair. I also think we have to look at these win totals in, in a couple different ways because most of these teams, if you're in it, you're going to add. And that's why it's kind of funny. But like when we talk about the Cardinals the last three years, you know, on paper, 
they were kind of the same team going into all three years. And it's it's pretty easy to say, oh, everybody was wrong last year. But guess what? If you're going to say that, then we were all wrong the previous two years because the Cardinals were not a playoff team those previous two years until they added Happ and Lester, until they added Quintana and Montgomery. So to me, like 85 wins is fine, but they're probably going to have to add a starter and a reliever. If, if they're in the mix, then they probably get to 90. If they suck again, well, then you probably start selling off assets and you're, you're probably close to 80. So it's easy to say, like, when we ask you for a win total, I mean, it's really not fair to do that, right? Now, you can also assume, though, like a lot of us said last winter, we think the Cardinals are going to be a playoff team, but that's assuming they're going to add. I mean, they added two freaking starters the previous two years. That's how they got to the playoffs. So I think doing the win total thing isn't really fair because whatever the Cardinals look like opening day, they're going to be totally different trade deadline. Not totally, but I would say significantly different trade deadline if they're in the mix. So what's the area that you think, let's say they're in the mix, but kind of middling, but they want, they're close enough to want to add. What's, do you think that's starting rotation? And if so, how, like walk, is it because somebody got hurt inevitably? And so they're, they're kind of a little bit on fumes that fifth day, or is it somebody that flames out of the rotation and he's just not performing? Like think Steven Matz at the beginning of last year, they said, oh, we got to move him to the bullpen. He's not performing. How, just if you had to guess, and again, this is just hypothetical, so we won't hold you to it, but like wh- it's July 30th and the Cardinals are in the mix. They're going to add a pitcher because how would you fill in that blank for, from your opinion? I would just say your your normal every year attrition, performance, age. I'm, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to pick which pitcher this happens to, Right. but you got five starters everybody's in their thirties to mid to upper thirties. And even if they were young, somebody's probably going to get hurt. And I would, I would say one of those guys might be pretty dang bad. And I'm not going to tell you who it is because I have no clue. But if one of those guys is pushing a six ERA after 20 starts, right. And then you give a, a Libertor or a Thompson a shot and they're not great either. That's where you just, most teams pick up, a reliable starter, and you usually need at least one reliever. That's what I'm saying. So this is not breaking news. I can't tell you who it's going to be. This is more just baseball, man. You know this. Pitchers get injured. Pitchers are bad. It's 162 games to think all these dudes are going to make 32 starts, 33 starts. It just hardly ever happens. You and I did a podcast a couple weeks ago where we said what? That happened in 2015 randomly for the Cardinals? Yeah. The only year that we've really seen anything like it, and they won 100 games as a result. So, but, and I think there's an element of the way they've built this rotation to be like that, but you can't possibly predict that. So that's what makes it interesting. It's like, we're acknowledging that that's not something you can manifest, but here they are trying to do it with the type of guys they got. Kyle Gibson's always taken his, his 30 starts. Lance Lynn, for the most part, will pitch through things and take the ball. His ERA might go up a little bit if he's not fully healthy, but he's going to be out there so that you don't have to put you know, last year's version of Drew Rom. not to say that Drew Rom can't be better this year, but like that's where they were toward the end of the year. Guys like Casey Lawrence and Jacob Barnes are going out there. Uh, Andrew Suarez are just pitching multiple inning chunks to get them through the season. They don't want that. They want to be competitive enough to where they don't have to go to that because they traded two starters away that sort of set that situation up at the deadline. But then they want to be able to get through August, September as a team hovering around maybe a couple games above 500. And maybe that's where they add a starting pitcher. Are you along with the rest of Cardinal Nation where a lot of fans, especially social media fans and the the commenters that we tend to see with the notion of, and you said it, they're a starter short. Is there a way that realistically that you thought they should have been able to to blend that and, and, and bridge that gap? Because I look at it as like, okay, we know Montgomery and Snell, those guys are like on the free agent market. But if you've got five starters in camp that are all being paid contracts, was there a way for the Cardinals to do it other than maybe a trade that you think they should have done it? Or are you just going, they're a starter short and like I'm looking at the roster and going, eh, they're about where they they have to be. Like, did you do you think they could have added realistically a free agent? And and how does that how does that conversation go, I guess, with a guy going, Yeah, we're adding a starter, but you know, we've already got five. 
It's that's where it was like a weird rub for me. Yeah, and I, I can't argue with myself because I, I feel like I said this all winter long. Look, this was the first Cardinal season in a long time that we started the winter very early. Like we started talking about 2024 in freaking what August. August. So yeah. I said this a million times on the radio. What I thought was going to happen, and we'll laugh, but we all knew they were getting sunny gray. Boom. Just lock that up. Yep. I always called it I always called it the Michael Waka bucket. The Michael Waka included Michael Waka and Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson. I always thought they'd get one of those guys. Well, they got two. And this is again, this is me. I've said the exact same thing going back to last August or whenever we started talking about 2024. I did think the third pitcher option was going to come via trade. I said all winter, again, I can't argue with myself. That's why when I grade the Cardinals, I said, I said the Cardinals need to have two starting pitchers better on paper than Miles Michaelis. I don't think they've achieved that. So I can't give them an A. Um, so that's where, look, these guys haven't been moved. But I, I thought because the Cardinals had such a position player uh, glut, they still got some bodies. I just felt like whether it was a trade for the Logan Gilbert type, the Dylan Cease, those guys weren't moved. Alec Manoa is not exactly the same, but there's a lot more upside. I thought a move like that was going to happen, and it didn't. They went for two guys from the Michael Waka bucket, which, again, I'm not saying it's not going to work, but I'm looking at the playoffs, and I just think the Cardinals on paper in the postseason look a hell of a lot better if Miles Michaelis is not their number two. And he probably won't be, by the way. What's either going to happen is Sonny Gray will be great, like if they're going to make the playoffs, we have to live in a world where Sonny Gray is good. So we're just going to let that yes. be like the, the assumed thing. Lance Lynn could be better than Miles Michaels this year because he controls more of what he does than Miles. Miles needs a good defense behind him to be great. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done it before, but he's not going to strike out more than six or seven guys per nine. Lance Lynn did last year have like more than nine per nine. Like he had more than a K per inning, if I'm not mistaken. We'll see what they get uh, from him strikeout wise, but he's always been a guy that can miss bats. But he also, you know what he's throwing. He's throwing a bunch of fastballs, and if the stuff is good on a given day, he's going to probably get some misses. If not, he's going to get hit around a little bit, so we'll see. But you said it. Deadline comes. They need to trade for that pitcher better than Miles Michaelis, and that's probably your number two in a playoff series. That could potentially work for them. But I was just curious because there are right now Cardinals fans going, hey, Blake Snell said he'll sign like a shorter term deal like Bellinger did. Hi, AAV, but not as many years with like opt outs and options and things like that. Hey, what about Jordan Montgomery? And I'm like, guys, can we please Jordan Montgomery doesn't want to come back to the Cardinals. Like it's not, it's not like there's a bunch of spite in it, but he's just, they're not going to have a reunion. I get that fans want to see that extra guy, but I agree with you. If it was going to happen, it had to come from trade. And those trades weren't made by any of the teams that we're talking about. And when you compare like a Waka to a Gibson, Think about what the Cardinals were really targeting, and you might scoff at it and say it was the wrong way, but I think they were targeting reliability. Walk mm -hmm. is going to have more of a Steven Matz, a three and a half ERA in 20 starts. Kyle yeah. Gibson's going to have a higher ERA, but he's making 30 starts, and that's what they really valued because they saw a group of guys last year that was not reliable to take the ball. What Say in your mind, think of whoever you think that was the problem with, and then you, you're right, because I think it was a combination of everybody, and they just, at the end of the day, had to do something different to try and make last year not happen again, knowing, perhaps, that if they're in a spot where one of the acquisitions has a 6 ERA or gets hurt, yeah, you can probably trade for a Dylan Cease at the deadline. Like, imagine the White Sox suck again. They might be more willing to trade then to a team that needs it desperately in the moment. So like, I wouldn't necessarily count that out as a possibility. All right. I know you got to go. So I'll just ask you if you, if you want, and if you got to go now, that's fine, but you can empty your notebook, anything else I don't you, have you've <laughs> heard, seen any interesting comments from any players, management coaches, or you can just say, Charlie, I got nothing. Shut up and we'll end it. Charlie, I got nothing. Shut up and we'll end it. No, like off the top of my head, there's nothing amazing. That's, I want to watch Victor Scott. I want to see more of Victor Scott because if he can hit, like we know he can field at a major league caliber level, in my opinion, I think he can run the bases at that level. I think he's going to continue to get better as a base runner with his world-class speed. If he can hit and Tommy Edmonds not ready, are you going to have Victor Scott on this team for a few weeks in April, or are you going to have Michael Ciani starting games? Not that Michael Ciani can't do a fine job defensively, 
But I'm very curious, like if there's a world in which Victor Scott can force the issue, I want to see that happen because I think it would be kind of chaotic and it would feel like Mason Wynn last year having a great spring, but the Cardinals going, there's just not really a spot for him and we want to see him more at the the AAA level. Victor Scott might not yet be there offensively, but what if he like was? And that would be kind of an interesting decision for the Cardinals. I don't think we're there yet, but if he has a, a great couple of weeks, maybe we will be able to start talking about and wondering about that in the event of Edmund not being ready for opening day. That's my that's my little tidbit I'll, I'll throw you at the end. All right. Can I start calling you little tidbit? I don't think that's very, I don't think that's very becoming at all. Um, but if it's just confined to this show, maybe. But if that's something like the cat got a hold of, because he doesn't listen to this, so it's fine. But if the cat got a hold of that, it would be, that would probably be not great for me because then we'd be in the Cardinals clubhouse and he would be like, hey, Nolan Gorman, did you know this guy's name is Little Tidbit? And then that's like a thing. <laughs> that can't be good for my brand, right? So I'm thinking we yeah. probably we probably shy away from that if I had a preference. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? And nobody's watching this or listening. No, so this is like 50 good. minutes into a podcast. They are gone. No, Don't. I think some people... I think some people listen and watch all of it. Hashtag yeah. little tidbit in the comment section on YouTube. Don't bring this to Twitter. Uh, but if you're if yeah, you're still so, listening, that'll be the way we know they listen to the end. Yes. Put hashtag little tidbit to prove you watched all 54 minutes of this. Okay. Yeah, like between Go. your between your signed Trevor Bauer replies and, and stuff like that, you can put the little tidbit thing because I know that takes up a lot of the comment section too. God dang, there are a lot of those. Just every day, sign Trevor Bauer. They got mad at me the other day on, on YouTube. And you, I want to talk through this real quick because you understand where I'm coming from with this. You do a much better job of if a comment is kind of asinine or rude or makes fun of people, you just kind of give it a heart and move on. But no, I'm kind of like, no, you no, stopped doing that? I don't. If, if, it's, if it's a dick comment, like, I, mean, I do really not like an rude. artist. Okay. I skip it. No, I skip. Okay. If it's a if it's a true dick comment, I skip it. But what I don't like is on YouTube Studio on my phone, I still see as like my most recent comment that I need to reply to. And sometimes I'll just reply like, hey, that wasn't nice. But then I get this reputation as this guy that, oh, he doesn't let us have fun on the channel. And there was one time where someone did a Trevor Bauer thing and I was like having a bad day. I was busy, wasn't seeing my kid. And so I was like, look, guys, on the Trevor Bauer thing, it, that's not happening so I think I'm just going to start to kind of remove these comments. And then YouTube studio doesn't give me any warning of this, that over the next 24 hours, there was like a, like a mob forming in the comments on one of these videos, like this guy's deleting or, and I never did. I never deleted any, but like somebody, I thought his comment was deleted. And so everybody's saying he's so soft, he's deleting comments. And I had to go through and like, look guys, I don't know. I didn't delete. I thought about doing it. I was in a bad moment, but the Trevor Bauer thing is so dumb because it's not like I'm the one that hates Trevor Bauer and says, no, you know, the Cardinals shouldn't sign him. 30 MLB teams haven't signed him to this point. But if you say, hey, the Trevor Bauer comments are kind of a lot in the comment section, you're like, you hate Trevor Bauer and he was innocent. And I'm just like, ah, the Cardinals aren't. Can, can't it be enough for me to like report to you that the Cardinals aren't signing him? And then you believe that just like I said, they're not going to sign Jordan Montgomery either. Like, what do I? I don't know. This was just my vent. At the end, I love all the commenters, but sometimes I'm like, hello, yes, sign Trevor Bauer. I'll get right on that. Like, I I don't work for the team, but they just, I get it. They just want to be able to kind of have their voice heard in, in, a, in a format that's talking about the Cardinals, even if it's not John Mosellock's inbox that, that's actually getting the comments. So rant over. I had to get that out in a, in a safe space with somebody who kind of knows what I'm talking about, even if I reacted a little strongly to be like, hey, I might just have to start kind of removing these comments. Like in the moment, I was just like, I get it. You want us, you want the Cardinals to sign Trevor Bauer. I understand. Yeah. And just so people know, and I'll, I'll end on this, but I think I've only removed comments if they're just like horrible, like horribly personal, terrible insults. But just so people know, cause I've been accused of this also. And, and also the political channel, which I don't, I don't censor anything. No, but, but people I, bet need to re get taken. I bet they get removed because sometimes it just happens and you're not the one doing it. And here's, that's what I want to say. Just so people know this, you have to put a filter on YouTube on your comments. If you don't, because I had this before, you will get all the spam bots and all the porn bots. And if you have to remove those, otherwise your comment section will be will be unreadable. Yep. So sometimes YouTube picks up other comments by accident. Now you could say, oh, they're censoring me. But I'm telling you, I've seen it happen. I've been accused of censoring comments. 
I don't do that, but you have to put a certain amount of filters on it to get rid of the spam bots and the porn bots. And every once in a while, a, a comment that should get through gets filtered, but that's just part of like the algorithm. Yep. And if your comment is just all caps sign Trevor Bauer, and that's all you put in the comment, like I might not have to go remove that. They might decide, oh, that's kind of spammy because this, this person has commented this on eight videos in a row, which at this point, when I see the comment, I just reply and I'm like, yeah, I'll get right on that. Like I'm having fun with it now, but like I, I wanted to talk this out with somebody. So the fact that it's on the podcast is perfectly good because I knew you would understand where I was coming from with this one. For sure, buddy. All right. Brendan Schaefer, great job. When are you coming back, by the way? This weekend, I'll start my drive back, and I'll be okay. all the way back in town by sometime Monday. Awesome. All right, you're doing a great job. Thank you, sir. Brendan Schaefer, follow him. B. Schaefer Daily. He's got all kinds of great videos. He's down there. He's getting uh, great content for y'all on YouTube and X, which he calls Twitter. I'm Charlie yeah, Marlowe. Twitter. Thank you for watching Low Hanging Fruit and listening. Have a great weekend, Brendan. Have a great weekend, everybody.